We're so excited to have you this evening and take it away. Um, I am so excited to be here and to be following that really, um, yes, sobering, but also inspiring set of comments by Deborah Enix Ross. I, I was struck by her comment that really the legitimacy of the ADR profession hinges on this project of diversifying the field, right? Legitimacy uh, in the eyes of the general public and in the eyes of um, those individuals who find themselves in arbitration hearings, mediation rooms, looking around uh, and looking for people who look like them and have had those life experiences. So this is an important project. And um, Deborah Enix Ross said, it's important for providers to step up. And I'm gonna be talking about um, my own organization, CPR, and some of the measures that we've taken to step up and, and, and work on this issue. So um, let me share my screen. Uh, can everybody see this? Maybe just a, a thumbs up. All right, excellent. All right, so making it real, the Ray Corollary Initiative. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what this initiative is, um, where it came from, uh, what it's designed to accomplish and how it fits into the overall project of diversifying uh, the ADR profession. Okay, so um, what is the Ray Corollary Initiative? You see a hammer there because uh, the RCI is a tool. It's a concrete mechanism to drive greater diversity in the selection of neutrals. It's the foundation of a plan of action to help ensure that all available talent in the ADR field is utilized and that the mediators and arbitrators who preside over and help facilitate resolution in ADR matters are representative of the populations they seek to serve. So where does the RCI come from? It's the brainchild of law professor and CPR board member, president of the National Academy of Arbitrators and practicing arbitrator Homer LaRue and arbitrator and National Academy of Arbitrators member, Alan Simonette, and was first articulated in a law review published in the winter of 2020 in the Howard Law Review, which is proof um, for those of us that have uh, worked as academics that ideas birthed in the pages of law review articles do sometimes make their way out of the library and into the world at large. The Ray Corollary is named after Charlotte E. Ray, who graduated from Howard University School of Law in 1872 and was the first black woman to be admitted to a bar in the United States. And it's a mechanism that borrows from two earlier initiatives that some of you may be familiar with, the Rooney Rule and the Mansfield certification process. The Rooney Rule was a policy adopted by the NFL in 2002 to rectify the glaring discrepancy in a football league in which 70% of the players were black, but head coaches of color were hired only about 2% of the time. The policy originally required every team with a head coaching vacancy to interview at least one or more diverse candidates before making a new hire. Over the years, the Rooney Rule expanded to include a greater number of positions across NFL clubs and to require each team to interview a minimum of two external minority candidates. A second initiative, the Mansfield Rule, also sought to diversify and disrupt an industry, in this case, big law, by asking firms to commit to changes in hiring and promotion practices. When the pilot certification first launched for large law firms in 2017, the primary requirement was to consider at least 30% women lawyers and lawyers who were members of underrepresented racial and ethnic groups for leadership roles. Subsequent versions were broadened each year to include LGBTQ lawyers, lawyers with disabilities, and to apply to critical pipeline activities, such as client pitch teams and other career enhancing work opportunities. The current certification process asks in-house legal departments 
to consider 50% diversity pools for top internal roles and outside counsel. So like the Rooney Rule, the RCI seeks to ensure that hiring pools for neutrals include diverse applicants. And like the Mansfield Rule, the RCI includes a specific metric, the 30% metric, a metric that has been empirically shown to be significant in disproportionately increasing the likelihood that a diverse candidate will actually be selected for the job at hand. So where does the RCI fit within that larger matrix of behaviors and interventions designed to diversify the ADR profession? So acknowledging that there are many facets to DEI work and multiple points of entry, CPR has adopted a four-pronged approach with each prong devoted to helping expand and broaden the constituency of the field and also reshape how work is distributed within that constituency. So these measures include efforts as have been discussed already tonight to grow the pipeline, to support the pipeline, to promote and educate on DEI and to improve selection. We can think of these functions as corresponding to both the supply and demand aspects of the ADR market. Growing and supporting the pipeline is necessary to ensure that there's a ready supply of diverse professionals with the training, education, and skills necessary to serve as mediators and arbitrators. And um, Genesis, you mentioned, you know, moving into uh, the role of a neutral wasn't sort of obvious and intuitive to you. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a sort of bridge that you, as a default matter, automatically walked across. And um, you know, part of our job as providers is um, to make sure that bridge exists, right? To educate, to um, promulgate, to make sure every population understands that this is a really vibrant, soul-satisfying industry and that they should think about it seriously. Um, so this is a task for educational institutions, including law schools, for training organizations, trade organizations, and for ADR providers who believe that offering a diverse group of individuals to serve as neutrals is essential for the continued vitality and integrity of the profession. And for this reason, you know, CPR works with the City Bar, the National Bar Association, uh, Women in Dispute Resolution, the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity, and seeks partnerships with law schools throughout the country to expand the number and breadth of law students and lawyers um, who can see themselves moving into um, the world of mediation, the world of arbitration in either a part-time or full-time capacity. Of course, growing the pool of capable and enthusiastic dispute resolvers represents a somewhat pyrrhic victory if that pool is not given the opportunity to apply their trade. So that takes us to the demand side component. We need to build demand for diverse neutrals. And this entails, again, as has been previously discussed, educating mediation and arbitration consumers, right? Clients, their attorneys, um, educating them of the importance of availing themselves of the vast array of talent that exists, not sticking to a narrow subsection uh, of, of that talent. It requires consumers to be mindful and intentional when it comes to choosing the neutrals they wish to preside over um, uh, when, when they're uh, embarking on mediation or arbitration. And it requires structural changes to the traditional ways in which neutrals are selected. And that is where the RCI comes in. All right, so typically, um, and, and everybody on this call knows this, how are mediators and arbitrators selected, right? Clients usually rely on their attorneys to select the neutral and attorneys rely typically on a small group of tried and true individuals who they've used in the past and feel comfortable continuing to use. Mediators are often hired through word of mouth, peer to peer recommendations. Law firms will send around an email who have you used? Who do you suggest? Who in this area is a known quantity? Arbitral selection similarly relies on party choice. 
either through direct designation or through a process of striking and ranking names on a list provided by the administering arbitral institution. Again, these choices are heavily influenced by comfort and familiarity and prior usage. This is a system that by definition excels in replication. It's a little like the AI tool, ChatGPT, which has been getting an awful lot of attention lately. It can take data, topics, concepts, even literary style, and mush them all together and assemble them in structures we would recognize as coherent. But there is no space for a true paradigm shift. Real change is not a viable product of this particular process. I also wanna point out that this system of select who you know, um, rinse, repeat, is also a perfect example of the status quo bias at work. We are cognitively wired to act in ways that maintain our current situation and oppose action that changes the existing state of affairs. So we hire those we've previously hired or hire those who resemble or remind us of those we've previously hired, right? And if we've previously hired older white males, well, let's stick with that model. And if they look like us, so much the better. The problem with the status quo bias in the words of one Wharton Business School publication is that it negatively affects one's ability to make decisions. Our ingrained preference for stability keeps us from judging different options fairly, which lead us to miss out on valuable opportunities. And that is clearly the case when it comes to selecting neutrals. So how do we interrupt the status quo bias? How do we interrupt implicit bias, the prejudice that assumes that only people we've already, we're already familiar with, people who look like us with our life experience can do a good job. Um, Joan Williams in her book, Bias Interrupted says among other things, um, it's critical to move from informal referral-based gut instinct processes, which ensure that hiring takes place in a Petri dish of bias to more formalized processes that rely on specific objective metrics, which is exactly what the RCI does. So what does the RCI do? It shifts the commitment to be both more specific and more achievable, achievable from, uh, yes, we're gonna think about uh, uh, diverse neutrals when it comes to assembling a pool, to we are uh, gonna endeavor to put together a list that is 30% diverse, right? So um, the 30% metric is really critical to uh, this initiative. Um, and then the question is why? Um, why do you see the 30% number in the RCI? Why do we see it in the Mansfield certification? And it's really grounded in social science data. Um, so you heard Professor Schneider basically say, yeah, some of this data doesn't really work very well. It's based on college aid women. You know, it doesn't really capture uh, the full population. Um, uh, but this social science data is pretty persuasive. Um, so uh, in a 2016 Harvard Business Review article, the authors looked retrospectively at one university's hiring decisions of white and non-white women and men for academic positions over a three-year period. The sample was 598 finalists, 174 of whom received job offers. Finalist pools ranged from three to 11 candidates. So the researchers wanted to see whether having more than one woman or minority in the finalist pool would increase the likelihood of hiring a woman or minority beyond the increase you'd expect simply due to mathematical probability. And what they found was when there were two female finalists, 
women had a significantly higher chance of being hired. The odds of hiring a woman were 79 times greater if there were at least two women in the finalist pool. There was also a significant effect for race. The odds of hiring a minority were 193 times greater if there were at least two minority candidates in the finalist pool. And this effect held no matter the size of the pool, whether it was six, eight, 10. Um, the simple takeaway was getting two in the pool results in significant changes. So if a list of five or seven arbitrators is being offered by CPR or five or 10 arbitrators being offered by AAA, the 30% metric ensures, ensures there will be at least two or more diverse candidates in that pool. So the rate corollary initiative has its own website. Um, one could go there and take a look at the actual pledge. CPR has adopted the pledge as the basis of its 2022 diversity commitment. So you could go onto CPR's um, brand spanking new website and take a look at uh, the RCI initiative um, there. But I'm just, I just want to um, run through very quickly uh, the commitments that are um, uh, required of signatories, right? So from the corporate community, um, you see the 30% metric highlighted in red. We set as a goal, include at least 30% diverse neutrals as candidates on any slate, which is gonna be uh, at least three, likely more, from which the mediators or arbitrators for a given matter are ultimately selected and we'll ask our outside law firms and counterparties to do the same from the law firm community. Um, again, uh, setting as a goal to include at least 30% diverse neutrals as candidates and CPR itself uh, committing uh, to uh, assemble lists including uh, at least 30% diverse neutrals. So, um, I do want to cover um, what is meant by diverse in the RCI, because that's, that's an interesting question. We've had a lot of discussions. So the definition here is Black, Hispanic, uh, Latina, Latino, Latinx. We all were educated about those various distinctions as this was being drafted. Uh, indigenous, um, uh, AAPI, other people of color, um, and also um, people of differing sexual orientations, gender identities, and people living with disabilities. And I, I want to say um, there's been quite a lot of attention in the mediation community on how we um, are uh, welcoming individuals with disabilities into the mediation room. Um, so there's been there's been quite a lot of um, attention paid to that question. And I, I, I think it's healthy. I think it's salutary and hopefully we'll continue to to um, make progress on on having the mediation rule room be as inclusive as possible. Um, Okay, RCI next steps. I, I wanna go back to Joan Williams's um, book, which is excellent and I, I highly recommend, um, where um, she says, look, the most important thing you can do is um, expand the pool, diversify the pool. Um, but uh, is, is that the end? Is that enough? Um, and the answer is, is no. Um, one has to make sure that the culture into which a diverse employee is hired is equitable and inclusive. So in her book, uh, Interrupting Bias, Professor Williams sets out a number of um, biases that, that are evident in the workplace and that she saw in engineering firms, architecture firms, law firms, um, you know, tech firms. Um, and uh, typically, the, the, the bias that struck out to me was the struck um, struck me the most was 
um, prove it again bias, which is um, a bias that diverse candidates encounter where their um, successes have to be replicated. It's not enough to succeed once or even twice. Um, they have to be continually um, demonstrating success. The standards that they're held to are higher and mistakes are um, highlighted in a way that is not the case for non-diverse uh, employees. Um, so she labels that prove it again um, and says this is, this is a hurdle um, that has to be overcome. So I guess what I would leave you with is um, I think the RCI is a really great initiative. It's important. Um, we hope everybody signs it. Um, but we also have to work on ongoing culture change so that once um, the neutral is um, selected, that he or she is held to the same standards, um, given the same um, welcome and the same uh, opportunities as non-diverse candidates. The end. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has them. Okay. Do you mind if I take down your screen? Uh, please do. Okay. Oh, whoops. Um, let's see. I don't know. Actually, I'm not a Mary. Would you mind doing that? Or, or, okay, great. Thank you. Um, we already have a question already. I have my questions here and Jeff, you're coming in, you're coming in with the question too. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask your question first. And then I, I have some that, I, that people have sent and that I also want to follow up with. Go right. ahead. Thanks so much, Genesis. Uh, Alan, great to see you. Uh, hey. Right. Uh, awesome to see you. Great job. Uh, quick question. Do you have problems with some uh, arbitrators not self-identifying that apply to your panel or that are on your panel? Not self-identifying as diverse. Yes. Huh. Okay, so let me just say that's a Helena question. Um, we over at the institute side, um, not not involved in the the inner workings of of. Um, so, um, great question, and uh, I can get you an answer, but it won't be from me. Okay, got it, got it. And then another, just one other question: Do you have uh, problems uh, meeting the thirty percent uh, with certain areas of the law, such as uh, construction? A construction case may you may not have enough neutrals that are oh yeah yeah i mean that's the that gets back to the grow the pipeline right oh. um so which is which is you know this is a it has to be multi-pronged right one initiative um on the demand side doesn't address the supply side and initiatives on the supply side don't it you know it, it, it has to be an integrated approach sure thank you Thank you. Excellent. That's a really good question, Jeff. I, there have definitely been times in my past where um, I have not identified, self-identified. Sure. And sometimes it's because I check three boxes. Yeah. So yeah, I'm we like- that, I'm, Yeah, we see that at the AAA and Anne will talk about that. We were see people don't self-identify and that that's a problem. And we try to uh, email our arbitrators and say, please self-identify uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's actually, um, I mean, raises really interesting questions of how people want to be um, seen in in their uh, work lives and and, um, and marketed, yeah, and right. marketed, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, I, you know, Ellen, you 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 gave us a lot to think about, um, and you probably want me to go straight into the the, the RCI, but I actually have a question about. Um, disability. So that's something that you raised that that's a that that's a discussion yeah. that um has increased in the ADR community. And and you know, one thing that's been really helpful with Zoom is that it's been helpful for a lot of people to be able to participate if you're you know, talking about captions and other kinds of things. But can you share with us just a, a snapshot of of what some of this discussion is in, in the community? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to. Um so um there's been discussion uh, on sort of specifically mediation listservs about um, how 
um, how best to um, provide accommodations to individuals, um, you know, not with obvious um, physical disabilities, back to Professor Schneider's um, point about what we see versus what we mm -hmm. don't see, but individuals who uh, come into the, the room with um, emotional or mental disabilities. And um, of course, self-determination is a fiction if an individual lacks the capacity to understand, appreciate, um, uh, communicate their wishes, right? So there are certain basic functionalities um, that disputants have to have in order to participate uh, in mediation. Um, so capacity is, 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 um, is, is a real mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, aspect of a disputant that, ha that the mediator has to pay attention to. On the other hand, we do not want to be screening out entire groups based on a certain mental health label. So it's this question of um, who's determining capacity? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of accommodations can be offered? Um, uh, are mediators, um, it, it, if a disputant doesn't mention uh, uh, a mental disability, um, what, what's the mediator's obligation? Uh, uh, to um, discern whether that's mm -hmm. at play. So it's all of these, it's all of these questions. Hmm. I mean, it's really good that we're talking about these questions because when, we, when we're in mediations and arbitrations, there are so many people in the room and we obviously, for this to be a meaningful um, experience, everyone needs to be able to participate, right? And so we're not just talking about the mediator, we're talking about everyone who's in that room. Right. Let me just let me just be really clear on one one particular tension. So um, uh, mediators may feel I can do a better job if I know that there is a dis disability here and I, um, uh, I I'm educated about uh, different disabilities. So I know what accommodation mm -hmm. to provide. On the other hand, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act protects individuals from um, invasions of privacy. So mm -hmm. if a mediator asks mm -hmm. about the presence of a disability, is that a privacy invasion? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so how does one fashion uh, an appropriate accommodation? Um, do you just say, does anyone in this room need an accommodation and leave it at that? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a really good question. Um, we wanna be inclusive, but we also wanna be respectful of boundaries. Um, Correct. And, and rights, for sure. That's that's the balancing act. Yeah. Well, I have another question for you, which kind of goes back to um, something you were, you were talking about before, which is um, the replication process and kind of the status quo, status quo bias, right? Um, and some people will say that um, they keep going to the same well because they can trust that well. There's so, mm. basically like this is about risk aversion. It's not necessarily about um, yes. you know, wanting to exclude people. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so uh, uh, Katie Simpson, who some of you might know from her work in women in dispute as wider uh, you know, arbitrator has talked about this and, and written about this, um, that it's, um, it's really a mistake to think, oh, I had a good experience with this one arbitrator or mediator in this particular type of case. So all future interactions will look like that past interactions. It's, it's, it's a form of cognitive error. Um, it's, it's, it's that type of thinking that we tilt towards um, because we do have this status quo bias. Um, and, it represents again faulty thinking in thinking. Well, um, there's nobody else who can provide um, those um, similarly uh, competent services, right? Um, so it's understandable. It's very human, um, but it's a mistake. Um, 
And when you think about the importance of diversity um, to representation, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a costly mistake. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's interesting because some of this, and I'm gonna kind of go back to some of the things that Professor Snyder was talking about, which is that some of these things are how we're raised and some of these things are a product of, 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 of what, what we learn and how we're socialized. And attorneys are often socialized um, to be risk averse, right? And so how do we kind of overcome this, this, this hump um, in order to, to be as inclusive as possible when we're kind of trained in a way not to do that because we want to protect our clients as much as we can. You know what I would say to someone who was saying, look, I'm not biased. I'm just risk averse. I've, I've worked with this person. I know what they know. Um, again, back to um, checklists, objective metrics. How about a questionnaire? And actually CPR has a really wonderful tool on its website. Um, these are the questions you want to be asking your neutral. Um, mm. You know, how many arbitrations have you done? How, if it's an intellectual property case, how many IP uh, matters have you handled? What's your background um, um, uh, in, um, you know, working with uh, companies from, <clears throat> from Europe, right? I mean, there are really targeted questions that can be asked regarding someone's skill set and experience that do a much better job of ferreting out Am I going to have a good experience with this person? Um, apart from, did someone in my firm use them three years ago? Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably true. That's probably true. Oh, yeah. Didn't, didn't Jonathan use that person back in uh, 2017, was it? Of course, they'll, they'll be good for this. You're right. You're right. That's a really good point. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, this, this was, again, such, a, such an important conversation. And certainly, um, I think we all appreciate learning a little bit more about the RCI, um, but also some of your comments about you know, ways that we can be inclusive of people, of, of neutrals, diverse neutrals, how we can be inclusive of everyone in, a, in an, an ADR space, um, and thinking about what are the objectives that, that help us decide who's the best neutral for a particular case. I really appreciate being invited and being able to have this conversation with everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, 